goodness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So goodness is running out. It's running out for me. So goodness is running out. It's running out for me. So goodness is running out. Hey, 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 hey. We are doing, this is the offering, offering time. It's a good time. Just another sign of worship. Come on. So goodness is running out. Okay. Um, all the stuff that we need is right there. You can text to give. 937-421-6755. Risenhopechurch.com slash giving. Checks paid out to Risen Hope Church. Right? Okay. And you guys have heard Pastor read this, and I want to read this again. And it comes out of Malachi 3. And I was led to read this. Verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows in heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing, then catch this, catch this, a blessing until there is no more need. Until there is no more need. So, Last, last Sunday, we had the, the Ogdens here, y'all. And listen to this. At, what was y'all? Was it a good? It was, man, it was good. The love offering, y'all, was $525. Until there is no more need, we have to do our part. So I'm going to pray over this offering. I was just mumbling around so you guys can write your checks. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this offering. Thank you for the jobs. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for opportunities to give. Thank you for who you are and why we do what we do. God, I pray that the words, until there is no more need, will fill our hearts until there was no more needs. In Jesus' name I pray. You can wait upon a congregation. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Today is, yeah, today is a special day because we get to celebrate so many things. We get to celebrate Father's Day today. And, amen. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there, you papas, spiritual fathers, physical fathers, whatever the case may be. And one of the special ways that we're going to do that today is by honoring those students who are moving up. Because there are students in our, our children's ministry that are, that are moving up today uh, or moving up this year into another grade level. And it's so exciting just to see them do that and, and watch as they grow and watch as they move into the young men and women of God that they've been called to be. Amen? I'm going to have uh, our leaders of our, our generation that is coming up step up with us. And we got a list of people that we'd like to honor today. Mr. Sean is going to take a group. <laughs> Mr. Sean has a few that he's going to graduate up out of the elementary class to the youth room. And Pastor Kylie has a few that she's going to graduate from middle school to high school while they'll still be under her group. And then we want to recognize a couple of our graduates today as well. Mr. Sean, you got your list? Yeah, it says with a heavy, heavy heart. No, I'm just playing. It, it, it's exciting. It's exciting. Don't get me wrong. Aliyah and Jay. But Aliyah, lovely Aliyah Arnold, and Mr. Jay Shulky, you guys got to come up here. Are, are leaving Mr. Sean. You guys line up right over there. 
are leaving Mr. Sean and graduating into the youth group. Um, real quick, I got to make it quite clear. I lost Haley and I lost KK. Now I'm losing Elia. My original group, I have Colton left and Bryson. So I told Liz that Colton and Bryson were just stuck with me. And Isaiah back there. You guys are just stuck with Mr. Sean for the rest of the time. There is no graduating or moving on. Just making that quite clear now. But congratulations to these guys. Mr. Sean's going to squat down here real quick. And I'm going to hand it over to Miss Kylie and Aiden. I don't like standing on the stage, so I'm going to come down here. Um, so it is a great privilege for me to be the youth pastor. I get to see kids come from the children's ministry up to our ministry. I get to see the students grow from kids into teens and then into young adults. It's truly a joy, even though I've only been here a year. The students I'm about to announce today, going from middle school to high school and also the graduate we have, have grown so much in just the year that I've known them. Um, so when I go ahead and announce your name, just you know, come on up and we'll, we got something for you. Um, so these are the students going from middle school into high school from fifth grade into sixth grade. It's middle school here. Where I grew up, it was seventh grade middle school. So, um, um, But the first is KK. You can, you can, you can come over here and stand even stand on the stage. It doesn't matter. Um, Haley. Um, and not all of the students are here, but we're going to clap for them anyway, just in case they're watching live stream and because we love them. Um, Aiden England is not here, but yeah, Aiden. Not me, not me. Um, Jasmine, also not here, but um, Ethan, not here. And last but not least, DK. Hey. <laughs> He really will eat your candy, bro, so you may want to take that. <laughs> All right, let's hear it and congratulate our middle school graduates one more time. Oh, wait, hold on. Let's get in this picture. Hold on. DK's hair is too tall. <laughs> Then we do have um, a couple graduates, one of which is not here and one of which is here. Um, graduating high school, even though it was not that long ago for me, um, it's still something that uh, it's just, it's something, you know. You, you graduate from being a kid to being an adult and you don't know what you're going into and still I still feel like that sometimes, but... Um, but graduating high school is a big thing. So uh, I know we clapped for the middle schoolers, but I know you guys can be louder than that because I hear you doing during worship. So we're going to congratulate the high school graduates even louder. Um, Maddie is not here, but she graduated from high school. <laughs> um, Tysana also graduated. And then, again, last but not least, Trent Collier. <laughs> and uh, he not only graduated from high school, but with a trade. So I'm, I'm sure that was even harder. But uh, we, got, we got you a Bible, buddy, because the word of God will never fail you. And... Uh, that, that right there will carry you through your life. Um, we'll get a picture, and then we're going to pray over you as you enter your next season of life. Um, 
Um, Pastor Liz, if you want to come up and Shay and Henry and Becca, our leadership team, our youth leaders as well, if you're in the house. Kendrick, you're new, but you can come join us. It's a big day when everyone around you is growing up. Yeah, I remember when all of y'all was in diapers, and uh, now you're graduating away and leaving high school and leaving the home, and uh, there are a couple of you now that are in, uh, in high school, and so your years are even shorter now. Uh, of course, they'll be different, and we'll still cherish them, and then, of course, the ones moving from elementary to uh, middle school. Uh, you know, it's a wave going forth, and we get the opportunity to lead and guide them, amen? We get the opportunity as a family to pour into their lives. I believe the Bible tells us that it really does take a community. It doesn't say it in those exact words, but, but we see the community of believers raising up other believers, amen? And that's our job to do along with the parents. It's, it's our job to assist the parents and, and lead and guide alongside of the parents, of course, under that, that parent's covenant and anointing for that specific child because God says to raise them up in the way that they should go. Amen? And that's not always easy for us to raise them up in the way they should go because there's a big difference because oftentimes when we hear Proverbs 22 and 6, we think, uh, uh, we, we hear it this way, raise them up in the way I think they should go. Amen? And the Lord didn't say that. Uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and all who want to go to the Father have to come by him. And so there's a journey that Jesus has for each and every one of us, and we should raise them up in the way that they should go. And as a father, I'm learning that's often far different than my opinion. Amen? You can stay home with Dad, and that's fine. Uh, regardless of what Jesus does with you, you're still not allowed to date for about... 16 more years. I'll put you right about 30, 29. You can start. Yeah. I'll start fishing a pond for you. <laughs> we'll do like what they used to do in. <laughs> we'll do what they used to do in the, in the old times. We'll bring, we'll bring the candidates ahead that have been previously selected. <laughs> She's not feeling it. It's easier that way. <laughs> Listen, if you have your Bibles, I need you to turn to uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 30. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Luke 10, verse 30. If, you, if your Bible glows, you can jump over to the ESV with me. That's a translation I like to read out of. Uh, if you still carry your leather bound uh, and your translation is a little different, it's all right. We're going to get the word. Amen. I'll set the scene for us as you're turning your scriptures. Uh, there's a lawyer, and he's standing in front of Jesus. And, of course, like many, he wants to put Jesus to the test. He wants to know what Jesus will say. And so oftentimes, just as the world is doing to us today, the people of Jesus' day was trying to catch Jesus up. You see it all the time. People trying to question your, your, your faith, the validity in your faith, your Christianity, how devoted you are. They question whether or not you're a Christian because of the things you do say, where, whatever the case may be. And they're constantly trying to uh, trap us, per se. Anybody ever feel that in our society? There's always a, a trap for the Christian to mess up. 
It takes you years to build a reputation. And if you have one moment of weakness in the flesh, oh my goodness, you're the worst piece of scumbag that ever existed in the whole world. And because you stubbed your toe and let out one little curse word, you're truly not a Christian. Don't do that. You're truly not a Christian, right? <laughs> I, when I stub my toe now or, or something like that, I just go, Pfft. You know, just kind of like, a, oh, help me, Jesus. Push it through. It's just, uh, so if you ever hear me breathing like that, that's my, don't talk to me for a minute. I just hit my, I did a lot of those helping uh, my sister-in-law over the past couple weeks. Uh, I'm not as skilled with the hammer as I used to be, and I got a couple uh, purple fingertips, right? And those purple fingertips er, end with, <laughs> right? Because you're mad. You don't want to do that. That's not good. But just the same thing is happening here. These people want to catch Jesus up. They want to prove that he's not the Messiah. And they're trying to foul Jesus in his words. They want to show that Jesus is not really the Messiah. He's not the king of kings. He's not divine. He's not, a, he, he's not of the same essence of God himself. And so here the lawyer stands before Jesus. And he begins to test him. And dropping down to verse 29, after Jesus has answered him, the lawyer needs to justify himself because, after all, Jesus answered prophetically and with wisdom and divine power. And, and, and the lawyer says, okay, i got to justify myself. He, he, he's put me on my back. He's messed me up. So in verse 29, the lawyer says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because you've heard Jesus say to love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's one of the greatest commandments that we're given, right? Uh, they will know you are my disciples by the love that you have for each other, right? Come on. And so he says, well, okay, Jesus, you know, who's my neighbor, Jesus? Who, who do I have to love? In other words, what he's getting at with Jesus is who do I have to love? If I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, which one do I have to love? The Jew, the Samaritan, right? Which one is it that I have to love? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among some robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead, picking up in verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was going down. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So he's along his journey. He sees the man who's beaten and left for dead, and he goes to the opposite side of the road as to not be bothered. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, did the same thing. He passed by on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Church, say Compassion. He went and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will come back. I will repay you when I come back. Of course, the conversation goes on, and Jesus says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And, of course, they said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to them, Likewise, you go and do also. Let's pray over the word of God this morning. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your name because it is worthy to be glorified. Lord, your name is worthy to be glorified. Your name is worthy to be lifted up. Your name is worthy to be exalted. And today, Lord God, we honor and we seek to exalt you. We seek to cherish you. We seek that you would breathe new life into our community, into our church, and into our our graduates into mothers and fathers lord whatever it may be we seek your life we seek your love and your favor in jesus name the church would say amen i love this story because there's some things that happen here now a priest his design was to uh was to take care of the temple he was uh the sanctuary keeper his his job was to lead the community of faith the believers around him to uh, an understanding of who god was in other words if we're going to put it into modern day context this was the pastor that's how a priest was served he was the pastor of that community and the levite in this 
uh, understanding of who he was, the Levitical tribe would run through, and their job was to serve the priest. And so now we're coming along, and what we essentially have, if we're going to put it into modern-day terms for us, we have a senior pastor along the road, and we have an assistant pastor that's in the caravan behind The pastor, right? Because there was a priest who cared for the temple and the people. And there was the Levitical tribe, the Levite who was coming, who was to assist the priest. His job was to help assist that organization of worship and sacrifice and heading to God, right? And so as the pastor comes along, I see this scenario where he's coming down the road and he bumps into somebody who doesn't look like him. He bumps into somebody who is dying spiritually. Of course, in the scripture, Jesus talks and this man is dying physically. But if we're going to run the parable out, we need to understand that this man is a, a spiritual essence of death that is happening right here. And the pastor comes and sees him. And in his mind, I can see this thought of that's not one of my flock. That one's dying and he's spiritually lost and he's out there by the wayside and he goes to that other church down the street. He's part of that Baptist denomination. He's part of that Nazarene denomination. He's part of that that Methodist denomination or he's one of those Pentecostals. He must like carry snakes and I don't want to get that on me, right? Come on. And so he's made up in his mind that he's not going to mess with this guy. And so he scoots to the other side of the road because this isn't his problem. This is somebody else's deal to deal with. Now, if we're talking through rituals and things of that nature, uh, another thing that would have been an issue for this, uh, this priest was that if he touched a dead body, he would have to go through all sorts of ceremonial rites. He'd have to go through all types of cleansings. He'd have to, to cleanse himself and purify himself, and he would have to make himself whole before he could enter back into the temple and serve offerings unto God. So this situation that he's coming up upon is not his problem because it's not his flock. And if he messes with this boy, then he's got all kinds of stuff he's got to go through. He's got to go cleanse himself. He's got to go purify himself. He's got to go make himself whole so he could enter into the temple and and fulfill his title. In other words, he was more worried about the legalistic nature of the situation than he was the person. The problem is, though, is that his assistant pastor, see, see, culture's not... Taught, culture is caught. And so now we have the priest who's come along and dodged the bullet and got to the other side of the road. And now we have the the Levite who is the assistant pastor that comes along and gets this. He said, look, if my pastor can do it, I can do it. I wonder if the pastor was texting him a little bit, you know. Hey, listen, when you come down the road, there's somebody beaten and half dead. Avoid that. I've seen where they go to church. I've seen the the stuff that they carry. I've seen what they've been going through. Uh, They don't look like me. They don't talk with me. Right, right, come on. And so that culture is taught. And sometimes... We hear our kids say things that we have no idea where we got it from, and it's because the culture around them teaches them things sometimes, right? You know what happens. You've all been around kids. I'm sure y'all got a kid that's done it to you before, or you've been around when somebody's kid's done it. They pop off a little something at the mouth, and you think, where in the world did that come from? I don't say that, but the culture has taught. The culture's a good teacher, ain't Come on. And so culturally, we're taught that. And so the Levi jumps to the other side of the road. Because he's not going to mess with that either. Because he's got to go through the same exact things that the priest has got to go through. And so if he cares for this man, if he takes his time, if he transitions from his path to mess with this man, then he has to go do all these purification rites that will take much longer than what it would have to take care of the man. And so he outweighs the cost. And the cost of caring is too much. Because of what it cost him. But there's this other guy that comes along. And he's coming around down the road. And Jesus calls him the Good Samaritan. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as he comes along, he sees him there. And watch what happens. The Bible says he immediately goes to him. He immediately goes to him. And he begins to uh, uh, bind him up. Not to bind him physically that he can't be released. But to bind his wounds for him. In other words, he steps into a spiritual situation that somebody is going through. And he binds the spiritual problem in their life. Right? Jesus calls that the Good Samaritan. That he came along. Watch, I feel like maybe he just seen Jesus' life and understood what Jesus was doing. Because listen, 
Jesus was a man who walked and operated with a mission on his life. But when things came up, he took time to entertain the interruption. In other words, Jesus was a person that knew where he was going, but was willing to step in to the transition of life to meet the needs of the people around him. Come on, that's where you amen. Think about Jesus, he's going to heal the little girl, and on the way to heal the little girl, he's, he's going along, and someone reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, and Jesus stops in the middle of that crowd, and he says, what, who touched me, because power has gone out from me, and of course, the disciples are like, this cat, what do you mean, who touched you, Jesus? There's a crowd, everybody's touching you. But I love what Jesus says because he's a person of transition in his life because he says, no, 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 no. Something's happening. My mission is out there and I'm going to fulfill my mission, but something has transitioned in my life. This is different than people just reaching out and touching a hold. Power has gone from me. I feel something go from me. Somebody that is, and he transitions from one moment to the next moment. You see, if we're going to be people of purpose in 2020, if we're going to run as men of purpose in 2020, we have to be able to transition into the different moments of our life. Jesus knew where he needed to be, but he transitioned to the woman with an issue of blood because she needed that healing right now. Just like the parable he was telling, going down the side of the road with the good Samaritan, he transitioned and inconvenienced himself. He had somewhere he had to go. He had somewhere he had to be. He had an appointment. As a matter of fact, he stalled his appointment, took care of the person, and then said, hey, listen, I got to transition back into my journey. But I'm going to make another transition when it's done. I'm going to transition. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to make sure you got all the money you need for taking care of this. You see, I've learned in our life that if we're going to be people that are walking in the power of God, if we're going to be men of purpose, we have to be men who are willing to raise up the next generation around us. Therefore, we can be people of purpose. In the book of Deuteronomy, it talks so much about a father raising up in the morning and training his children, coming around the dinner table for lunch and for dinner and training his children, talking about as you are along the way, as you are going to train your children. Watch this in, in the Old Testament. The father figure was so much more a part of the young person's life. If the father would go out to work, the young boys would follow the father out to work. When the father was done, he put his nine to five in, out there messing with the thorns and the bushes and the sweat and the heat of the sun. He didn't come home and ask for a cold buddy light and, and sit down at a table and let the wife continue to work. No, he came home after having the boys with him, teaching them how to be a man and help teach school lessons to the young children. Jesus said to raise them up. God told him in this incident, rather in, in Deuteronomy, that you are to raise them as you are going. Watch what the Bible says in Matthew 28, uh, 28 and 19. The Bible says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, right? And so oftentimes we take that as our cue to go to Haiti, to go to England, to go to China, to go to Russia. And listen, that's all well and good. But if we're going to drop back to a transliteral uh, understanding of what Jesus was saying there, he said, as you are along your way, as you are going, make disciples. Well, who goes with me? Who sees me make disciples? Who watches me preach? Who watches me pray? And who watches me? me read my bible my babies i'm making disciples jesus didn't say hey when you get to china baby boy start making disciples he said in other words if you can't make disciples in your own home don't even go there after all he told the apostles there in acts 1 to, to, to go from judea to jerusalem from jerusalem to judea excuse me to samaria and to the ends of the world he said start in your backyard start with the ones you're wiping boogers off of Cleaning their butts. <laughs> and guess what? Make them disciples. A statistic that you're probably aware of, and it's a media-driven statistic, and I, and I hate the way that our media stirs things, don't you? Now, I think it's time for Christians to stand up in America and say that we're no longer going to allow the media to tell our story. But there are penitentiaries filled with people who, guess what, don't have daddies. If you see the most common stat, the most common stat would be put out, well, but the black man is in prison because he doesn't have a father. 
There's no father figure in his life. And that's the statistic that we hear. And it's always pushed out into us. Or the black community. And that's true. I, I'm not, please understand my heart. I'm not minimizing that at all. But watch what I want to show you. Go to prison. Ask all those white boys in there. How was your daddy in your life? Go to prison and ask all the Puerto Rican boys, how was daddy in your life? Go ask the Latino boys and the Chinese boys that are in prison. The statistic runs through and through. Yes, it stands true with the black community, and I'm not minimizing that at all, but it's the white community. It's the uh, Japanese community, the Korean, every community, every man. And now, now it's not across the board, but the statistics are very high. Why? Because there was no one to raise up in the morning and pray with them. There was no one to eat lunch and talk about the word of God. Come on, somebody. Now you take a statistic of people who go to prison, who have a father in their life, and that number is so low, it's crazy. You think some man would grow a back? bone and start raising their babies and keep them out of the jails we're along this way and we have to be like Jesus we have to be men who are able to transition from the good Samaritan to our journey along the path transitioning from being a father to a worker to a provider come on somebody to a leader or whatever God calls you to be but never taking our eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ the problem in our churches though is that so oftentimes we get stuck in this one way lane of what our journey ought to be like God anoints your life and that's it boom God I'm children ministry I don't mess with the women the men I don't mess with the old or the ugly Lord Jesus I just mess with the children right come on right sometimes God calls us to transition into the season we get stuck on that one-way road that one-way journey and we get tunnel visions as Christians but if we're going to be men of purpose who are going to raise up women and children of purpose as well and go forth in the community then we have to be people of transition don't we come Whoa, it was compassion. What, what are you doing? It was compassion that the man came down the path and he seen the man. But he stopped what he there. was doing and transitioned. But it was a move of compassion. Yo, I really do. Whoa, but, but my I'm trying is, to preach. I, I feel you, Pastor. I feel you, Pastor. But when I read the story, it's all about vision. See, the first two men, the, the priest and the Levite, they were blind. They didn't even see the man. They walked to the other side. But see, that good Samaritan, as he was walking, he had heavenly vision. It's 2020, church family. What's 2020 mean? Perfect vision. I think it's time that we finally, as a church, as a family, I think it's fine. We get some heavenly vision. And when we see that man struggling, we stop and we help. So are we going to get heavenly vision? Compassion. Okay. There was a Jew that was coming down the path. And he seen the brother laying there. And he walked away. There was a Levi who seen the brother laying there, decided that he may want to help him, but he seen the dirt, the mess, and the situation he was in, and he was said, no, I can't get myself involved in that. Notice, church, how they said there was a good Samaritan coming by. Hallelujah. The man did not care about his status, church. He didn't care about his status. Church, he said he was a good Samaritan. He didn't care that the Jews may have thought differently about him. All he cared about, that there was a brother in need, church. He came over, and as he walked, he saw compassion. And he reached out, and he gave this man bandage, bandaged his wounds, healed him, brought him to, brought him to a place where he told them, he said, hey, Take care of my brother. I will give you whatever money you ask. Just take care of my brother. How many times, church, have we been involved in some messes in our life? Hallelujah. How many times, church, has someone passed us by? But the heavenly father, Jesus, has never passed you by. He's never passed you by. He's always willing to have a heart of compassion. And he's reaching over saying, Sean, I got you, Sean. I got you, Sean. It's going to be all right. Just stay focused. Keep your heart on me. Come on. The good Samaritans say, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to get in this mess with my brother. I'm going to get in this mess with my brother. No matter what he's facing in life, I'm going to get in this mess with my brother. Hallelujah. I'm going to get through this mess with my brother. Jesus, hallelujah. So he picks him up, bandages his wounds, takes him to the place. Take care of my brother. I will give you whatever money you need. Jesus, you are worthy. Compassion. Compassion looks for the suffering. Compassion looks for the weak. Compassion looks for those that are in need. Church, it is time we grow a heart of compassion for our brothers and sisters. Church, it is time we grow a heart for our colored people. It don't matter if you're black. It don't matter if you're white. It don't matter if you're Latino. It's God's people. It's all one in accord. Hallelujah. Jesus, you are worthy. Mm, my God, my God. It said that Jesus had compassion over the multitude. As a sheep, we're not a shepherd. Hallelujah. I remember a great time in my life where I was that man in that hole. Hallelujah. Mm. I was the man in that hole, and I seen so many people pass me by. But Jesus came to me. He said, son, I don't care that you're a drug addict. Son, I don't care that you've been through hell and back. I'm going to be here for you. Hallelujah. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy, God. Two years clean by the grace of God. Jesus, you are worthy. Hallelujah. Two years clean. They're, they're make, I'm a supervisor of a multi-billionaire company. Come on, church. God would take a mess. He would take trash. And he will make greatness into it. I promise you that. Jesus, hallelujah. A move of compassion. Jesus. And, 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 and I feel you, man. That's powerful. That's powerful. But see, if the... If the man never saw him, it still wouldn't have mattered. See, if Jesus would have never saw you, it still wouldn't have mattered. If Jesus didn't have a vision for your life, it still wouldn't have mattered. Right, right. So when I read this story, it's, it's still about vision. It's about seeing with heavenly eyes. Jesus didn't care that you were struggling with what you were struggling with. He knew Jeremiah 1. He said, I got great plans for you, Jeremiah 29. 11. I still got great plans for you. See, and it's about that vision, church. And if we could get that vision about our brothers and sisters, it wouldn't matter. Because, see, we keep looking with earthly eyes. And earthly eyes, they divide. You know, we can't look and say, well, he's black and he's white. He's young and he's old. We can't look like that anymore because we see what the world is looking like. See, in Matthew 6, it says the eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, the whole body is healthy. See, if we could get our eyes fixed on God, if we could get our eyes fixed on that heavenly vision, it would fix all that stuff. Racism would die. Hatred would die. It would go away because, because what I know is, what I know is Genesis 1, 26, 27. He said he made mankind in all, in, in his image. All mankind. Not black people, not white. All mankind. Church, if we could get a hold of that, if we could get a hold of that, it would fall away. All the issues we see. Because I know one thing. There's one body. There's one body. There may be many members. We may look different. But there's only one body. You know, the hand, it needs the elbow. The elbow needs the hand. We got to do this together, church. There's only one. And, and, until we get to that, it doesn't matter. In Proverbs, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, people perish, church. So we got to get that vision together because I'm tired of seeing my brother laying on the side perishing. I'm tired of seeing my sister down there perishing. Church, we got the ability. We got the resource. We can come together and we can do this. But what's our vision? Are we going to move forward or are we going to go to the other side? See, the priests and the Levites, they, they went to the other side. They, they said, well, that's not in my neighborhood. That, that's not in my demographic background. We, we don't struggle with that stuff. But see, that good Samaritan, he, he looked down and he said, man, that, that could be me. Church, we all been there one day where you know that could have been you. And like Ann said, man, God saw that. Once again, with vision, God with his heavenly vision, he saw, and he said, I'm going to send a good Samaritan. I'm going to break all racial barriers. I'm going to break all econ economic uh, 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 barriers, and I'm going to have somebody come and help him. And church, we all have that chance. We all have that opportunity. It's a vision we got to catch a hold of. So we're going to catch a hold of.
Hold up. Hold up. Y'all got to have to come to my office after this. You just cannot be doing in a hijacking my sermons like this. I'm trying to sweat and preach and y'all come up in here and but hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I think I'm putting it together now. I think I'm, 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 God's giving me the picture right now. He's helping me out with this. In other words, what, if we're going to be men of purpose who are going to raise up children and women around us, who are going to raise up communities around us, if we're going to be men of purpose, then we have to be moved by compassion just like Jesus was. Just like when in the scriptures, when the Bible talks about he was moved with compassion and what he came in and he healed them is what the scripture says. When he was moved with that compassion, somebody, he was moved with so much compassion that he went to the cross. And I'm going to tell you like this, Brother Kendrick. If that man didn't have vision beyond the cross, he would have never been there. Because after the cross, well, before the cross was a beating, right? Come on, somebody. And he's seen the cross after that. And he's seen the grave after that. And he's seen the moment in hell after that. And then he's seen what? The triumphant return up out of that grave, conquering death, hell, and our sins. You see, so he was moved with compassion, and he walked with the heavenly vision to see what was going forth. But in the midst of all of that, he made transitions from his preaching ministry to his healing ministry. Come on, somebody. To his compounding ministry, to the cross ministry. Can I get a witness in this house? Come on, worship team. We're about to praise the Lord in here. You see, if we're going to walk... Anthony, just stay up here. If we're going to walk as men of purpose, the next three weeks, over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about compassion, vision, and transition. You're not going to want to miss a thing. If you think that this was good today, it's only going to get better. Read the sign on your way out, right? The best is yet to come. We're going to learn how God wants to stir us for heavenly vision. And we're going to learn how God wants to stir us for a heavenly compassion. We're going to learn how God carries us through heavenly transitions. Would you stand all across the sanctuary with me today? Did you receive the word of the Lord today? Like I said, we're going to be diving deeper over the next three weeks. I know people had stuff to do because it was Father's Day, but you better text them and say, boy, you missed that. All across this sanctuary right now, let's begin to dig into our hearts. And I would like to ask us a question before we go any further. Who do you identify with in this story? Are we the priest? Are we the one who culture was caught and not taught? Or are we the Good Samaritan? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not calling you out. But in life, if we have found ourselves passing by moments of ministry for something else, we've missed what the Lord God is trying to do. Did you know that the word minister means to serve? And so, if you're trying... In the church of God, we have different ranks of ministerial status. You can be exhorter, you can be the ordained license, or you can go to bishop. A bishop is the highest status as far as the credentialing goes. And then, of course, you can work in different offices, from state offices to to our general overseer of the whole denomination. But we have to understand something with that word ministry. The higher we climb in ministerial status the lower we must go in our service. Come on. Some of y'all missed that. If you say you're a Sunday school teacher, we got to be careful what titles we put on ourselves in ministry. Because if we say that we're a children's ministry pastor, yet we won't go get that child from over in that neighborhood that we don't want to be in. Or they grew up different than us. So they, whatever the case is, somebody. Then we're really not a minister. We're a fake and a fraud. 
But God's called for us to go higher and God will elevate us and God will give you titles and God will give you esteem and God will give honor where honor is due as long as you do what Jesus Christ did and take off that outer garment and come down to the feet of those that you serve. As a matter of fact, let me say that differently. Come to the feet of those that you lead. And you can look them in the eye and say, I'm not like that priest, which you probably shouldn't say this. In a moment of ministry. I'm not like that priest. I'm not like that. I'm not like that Levi. But I just want to do ministry. I just want to serve you. I think about the most profound thing that happens in this illustration that we're giving is the Samaritan was only given a title after he got down on his hands and knees. Oh, somebody let that be caught. And cared for somebody that was from the guttermost. Took him to a person that could help him go to the uttermost somebody. And the only three people that knew on earth was the Samaritan, the almost dead man, and the innkeeper. Where are we at in this picture? Come on church, dig deep today. Begin to war, begin to war. You can link hands, you can link arms, you can begin to pray over somebody. If anybody needs prayer for anything, these two men of God, right, on my left and on my right, they're going to come down, they're going to come down, and they will swarm you with the heavenly presence of the grace of God. Come on. Do you need prayer in this house? Come on, I see some hands. I see people. Anybody need some prayer today? Come on, any bitter, and he says, you know what, I need better vision. I need more, I need more compassion, preacher. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see of the goodness of God 